نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Continuing with the subject of Imam Hussain al-Islam and Karbala So as we mentioned last week, you know, basically on the 10th of Muharram, you know, the drum beats are going, war drums are going, and eventually, Amr bin Saad comes and he shoots an arrow into the tent of Imam Hussein al -Islam. And he says that everybody be a witness that I am the first to shoot this arrow. You know, and all of this he's doing simply because he wants to become a governor of a territory. So then, you know, like I, hyenas, you know, they start running around all these, uh, the forces, uh, making noise, doing things, shooting arrows towards the tent of Imam Hussein al-Islam, and eventually, you know, the friends of Imam Hussein al-Islam who have come, they ask him permission, please allow us to go and meet the enemy and fight. You know, there's no sense in sitting here and letting them shoot us idly while we just sit and do nothing. And so Imam Hussein al-Islam gives them permission. So you have roughly about 50 of those who came with Imam Hussein al-Islam and a handful of those who had joined him along the way and a few who had snuck in from Kufa. And so these go and they, they challenge the enemy. And of course... <coughs> Of course, you know, what are 50 going to do? Or even what are 100, what would 100 do against 22,000? So eventually all of them are, are martyred. So all of them come, you know, all of them eventually attain true life. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الَّذِ وَلَا تَقُولُ لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَانْ وَلَا كِلَّ تَشْعُرُونَ That do not say that those who have been slain in the way of Allah, that they are dead. In reality, they are alive, but you don't perceive it. And so after all of these fall, then Imam Hussein al-Islam, he comes forward. And again, he addresses the forces of Yazid. But this time, a little different. This time he calls out and he says that, is there anyone who will come to uh, and support the family of Rasulullah in their hour of need? Is there anyone who by doing so is, will, is, is ready to enter Jannah. Hur bin Yazid, who was the first to come, who was the first to bring an army against Imam Hussain al-Islam. You know, the people around him, they say that you know, he became very uneasy when Imam Hussain al-Islam says this. It's like, you know, his whole demeanor changes. 
like something has been sparked inside of him and he becomes very restless and everybody is looking at him and, and asking him, those around him asking him, what's going on with you? We've never seen you like this. He says, what can I say? You know, on one side I'm being pulled into the fire and on the other side I'm being called towards Jannah. And he kicks his horse and he rides out and as he's riding out he says that if you can then you should enter Jannah. His sons ride out along with him and he comes before Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And he gets off of his horse and he comes and he says to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he says that I am that wretched person who was the first to bring an army against you. But I never imagined that it would come to this. I'd always thought that just like between Mabia radiallahu and your brother Imam Hassan Mujtaba salam, that there would be some resolution based on conditions. But these wretched people, all of your words have fallen on deaf ears. So now I come before you and if I sacrifice myself for you, then will your, will your grandfather intercede on my behalf on the Day of Judgment? And will I be free from the fire of hell? So Imam Hussain al Islam, he asked me, he says, what is your name? I mean, he knew his name, but he says, what is your name? He says, Hur. Hur means freedom. So he says, your mother named you correctly. Because if you do this sincerely, then you will be free from the fire of hell. Yet you come to me at a time when I have nothing to offer you. It's a characteristic of the household of Rasulullah. Sallallahu It didn't matter who went to them or when they went to them. And it didn't matter what condition they themselves were in. They always fed everybody. It says, you come to me at a time when I don't even have water to give to you. So he says that it, so I, I swear to you that on the day of judgment, that when we go before my grandfather, I will have you drink from the hawd of Gotha before I drink from it. You know, Gotha, Gotha means abundance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna atayna kal Gotha. To Rasulullah sallallahu that I have made you the owner of Gotha, of abundance. And this abundance means many things. It is also abundance of progeny. I mean, you look anywhere you go, you find Sayyid, true Sayyid, from the lineage of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But Gothar also refers to that, to that pool of water that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi will distribute from on the day of judgment that whoever drinks from it will not become thirsty again. So he says, on that day, then I will have you drink first before I drink. A couple of important points to understand here. You know, one is, you know, when Imam Hussein al-Islam, he goes before this force, you know, the Yazidi forces, 22,000. You know, if a handful of people change sides, you know, if a handful of people from that side come over to the side of Imam Hussein al-Islam, what difference does it make? And at the same time, you know, if everybody ab abandoned Imam Hussein al-Islam and went to the other side, what difference would it make? Even if a few hundred people switched sides from the, from the forces of Yazid and came over here, what difference was it going to make against 22,000? 
You know, you, if, even if you went from 22,000 to 21,500 against 500, that makes no difference. So why did Imam Hussein and Islam even go and, and, and make this announcement? You know, this is where we have to understand the status of Imam Hussein and Islam. You know, he is one of the leaders of the youth of Jannah. And in the spirit in the true spiritual realm, you know, which most of us have no understanding of. Those in authority know all of those who are underneath them, or those that they are, they, they are responsible for. You know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah sent him as Rahmatulil Alameen, a mercy to all of creation. If he doesn't know what my condition is at every moment, then how can he show mercy to me? You know, in order to be able to show mercy to somebody, I have to know what their condition is and what they need, what their needs are. What are they going through? What difficulties are, are happening to them at that moment? And what are what are the re, what is the resolution to that difficulty, or resolutions to the difficulties? So if Rasulullah Sallam does not know this at every given moment, then how can he be a mercy to anything? And yet Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says he is a mercy to all of creation. And it's not like he was the mercy. Or he will be the mercy. He is the mercy. You know, just like when we say the kalma la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, it isn't that he was the messenger. And nor is it that he will be the messenger. He is the messenger. You know, for all times, past, present, and future. And in the same way, he is the mercy to all of creation all of the time. And so, when he is the mercy to all of creation, he has to know the condition of the creation. And this is why also Allah Subhanahu says, An Nabi awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. That this Nabi, this Prophet, is closer to the believers in their own souls or their own selves. Meaning he knows my condition better than I know my condition. You know, we think, oh, you know, if I did this, everything would be better. And then when I do that, things aren't better. Yet he knows the solution to my problems. Whether I listen to, to, to the solutions or not is a different issue. You know, it's like you have a, uh, a transmitter and on the other side you have a receiver. You know, it's like these days, you know, you've got, uh, you know, like 5G's out. You got 5G and you got 4G and you got all the other G's and, and everything else. So let's say you have a TV. Now, of course, you know, it used to just be black and white. The thing was that the transmitter, transmitter used to be black and white. And so the, all the receivers were black and white. So you received what was transmitted. But then they graded or did an upgrade on the transmitter and made it color. If you still have a black and white TV, you, you know, they might be sending it in color, but you can't get color. You can only get black and white. Same way, you know, when they upgraded from color, now they got the smart TVs. 4K and whatever else. So they can be sending it 
in 4K, but if you still have a regular color TV, all you're going to get is the regular color. There, are no, there is no issue with the transmitter here. The Rasulullah has transmitted, is transmitting everything we need. The problem is the receivers. And this is where you see difference within people. Some receivers are better than others. So when the message comes, you know, they know what to do with it. But again, getting back to the issue of, in the spiritual realm, the one in authority keeps an eye on all those who he is responsible for. Imam Hussein al-Islam is the leader of the youth of Jannah. He knows who's going to be with him in Jannah. And he's looking in this massive force that's come against him, all of whom are going to be in the fire. And yet within this 22,000 force, he sees a couple of people that are in the wrong place. And so he goes to call them out, that you're not one of them, you're one of us. Take your correct position. And so now, you know, after talking with Imam Hussein al Islam and then, you know, Hurra along with his sons now addresses the forces of Yazid. And he says that, you know, that you wretched people, you are, you have come to fight against the one who, whose grand, whose grandfather, your whose grandfather Skalma you read. You know, you recite La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And yet you've come to kill his grandson. You've come against those who you mention in every salat. You know, because this force that had come. You know, people think, oh, you know, they weren't religious. Uh, from the, from the, out, from, from the facade of things, they were very religious. And we've mentioned this before, you had at least 500 Qadi among them. You know, pe people whose knowledge level was to the point that they could be an Islamic judge, and they were Islamic judges. Many Huffaz, hundreds of Huffaz among them, scholars and everybody. People who knew Hadith very well. But when the hearts are devoid of Allah, of the love of Allah and His Messenger, then nothing else matters. So he says, you know, you are, you are coming, you have come to kill the one who you send salat, uh, salat on in every, every salat, you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. That Allah send blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And upon the progeny of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we say this every salat. And yet, here you are. And as he's talking, you know, of course, Amr and Shimr, the leaders of the force of Jid, ah, you know, he's become a traitor. You know, kill this traitor. And now they start attacking him. He wasn't hungry for three days and thirsty for three days like the previous you know, 50 or 60 people that they had martyred. So he took several of them along with him. But eventually, you know, what's a handful of, full of people going to do against 22,000? So now... There is no one left. 
in the camp of Imam Hussein al-Islam except those who are related to him by blood. So initially, his cousins, you know, three cousins, the three sons of Aqil, <coughs> his, uh, the brother of Ali, and they come out. And then after the, 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 they are martyred, then four of his brothers, if you remember, five of his brothers came with him. You know, these are the sons of Ali, but not the sons of Bibi Fatima, salam alayhi They are the sons through other wives of Ali, radiallahu So they go out, and you know, of course, you know, it's, they have the blood of Ali in them. You know, Ali is among the Asadullah, he is among the lions of Allah. He was the chief general of Rasulullah No one ever survived his attack. And no one was ever able to subdue him. You know, when he came into the battlefield, uh, the enemy had no hope. In the Battle of Badr, we've mentioned this many times, in the Battle of Badr, of the 70 leaders of Quraysh that were killed, 36 of them he killed himself. 13 he aided in the killing of, which leaves 21 for the remaining 312 soldiers and 5,000 angels that were sent by Allah. This is why the nephew of Abdullah ibn Masood, who was one of the Qadis of uh, or Fuqaha of Madina Munawwara, he said Ali was, was complete Badr. So you can imagine, even after being hungry and thirsty for three days, you know, the, the, the veracity which with they, which with they fought, killing so many of the enemy, but again, What's a handful going to do? And so now, you know, as far as who remains are his nephews, his sons, and one brother, Abbas, who was the flag bearer of Imam Hussein al -Salam. And so now, the sons, four sons of Imam Hassan, Mujtaba, alayhi salam, who had come along, you know, they asked permission. And if you start talking about, you know, you can read in the books, you know, the valor of each one. You know, if you start talking about that, you know, it can take a long time. But just to mention one of them, you know, after he finally gives them permission to go. And, you know, we can't imagine the condition of Imam Hussein al Islam as he's up, knowing what's going to happen to them. You know, and as the household members are falling, he rides out after each one, picks them up, and brings them back to the tent and lays them down. When the friends started fighting, it was probably mid morning, and this is from a solar calendar, this was October. So the days aren't that long. Uh, but you know, because there are, and the other aspect of that, you know, even though it was October, many people try to downplay, oh, it was, it was winter or October, so it wasn't that hot, so you know, they didn't drink for three days, it's not a big deal. You don't drink, drink for three days and see what the big deal is. And in the winter, even in the, in the, in the desert in the winter, the days are still hot, the nights are cold. And even when it's cold, you're still losing so much uh, uh, liquid through your breathing. You may not feel as thirsty, but you still lose it, you're still getting dehydrated. By the time the family members start to fight, it's the time. And so, 
initially, as we mentioned before, Imam Hussein al Islam had made Fajr with everybody that morning. And now, when the time of Dhuhr came, he made Dhuhr Salat as Salatul Khawf with the family. And Salatul Khawf is a Salat or prayer of fear, where what happens is that the Imam for Dhuhr Salat will make four rakat. Half of the group will make it with him for two rakats, and then after the, after the Imam sits during the second rakat, they will make salam and back off, and the other half will come and they will make the other two rakat with the Imam. <coughs> so this is Salat al Khawf. So after this is when the family members now start going, and one by one, they fall. And each one he goes out, brings back, and lays down in the tent. And then eventually when Imam Qasim, the son of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, Qasim, who at this time is in his late teens, early 20s, you know, he asked permission to ride out, and Imam Hussein, and he, Imam Qasim was betrothed to the, to the daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Bibi Sakina. So they were to be married. Now with this heavy heart, he eventually has, sees him ride out. And when Imam Qasim rides out, he says he addresses the forces of Yazid. He says, you know, what, what is this? You know, one of our men comes and 20 of you jump on top of him. He says, fight me like a man. Send somebody out here one on one and let him fight me like a man. So Amr bin Saad, he looks at one of the soldiers whose name was uh, Azda. And he tells him, he says, you go out. And this was a man who was, you know, a well-known soldier. You know, of course, you know, the exaggeration was that he could fight a thousand men. But just to give you an idea that he was, you know, very skilled and everybody was afraid of him. Massive man, and he's... So when Amr says to him, he says, you go and write, take care of me. He says, ah, this is an insult to me, that I should go and fight this boy. You know, I'm going to deal with, with, with Hussein, alayhi salam. You know, I have four sons in this army, and any one of them is enough for this boy. So he tells one of his sons, he says, go and take care of him. Son comes out on his horse. Qasim is on the horse of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he rides out and they start dueling with their swords and Imam Qasim, who has the blood of his father running through his veins, who has the blood of <laughs> Ali, the, the conqueror of Khaybar, and he dispatches him, knocks, you know, makes, makes one person into two. And then he takes you know, the, the sword that, that the son of Azra had was, you know, very beautiful and, and very, a good sword. So he takes that sword, puts his own sword in his own horse and sends the horse back. Gets on the horse of this guy's son. So now another son comes out and the same thing happens. And another son and the fourth son and eventually all four sons are gone. And now in his anger, you know, when he sees all of his sons being killed like this, Azraq, he comes out. Cursing, swearing, you know, I'm going to do this, and a few curse words in there, and do this. And Imam Qasim, he says that, look, you know, I am from the lineage of Rasulullah, and it is beneath me to respond in kind. You know, if you want to deal with me, then come. But he says, it's so interesting that people say that you're such a great warrior, and you don't even know the, how to tie the reins of your horse. You know, they're not even tied properly. And so he looks down at the reins of the horse, how they're tied, and in the meantime, Imam Qasim dispatches him as well. And now you can imagine, you know, one of their great warriors has just been killed by this young boy. 
the condition of the forces of Yazid. So the same thing. So now they start shooting arrows and eventually he's martyred. And Imam Hussein al-Islam, he rides out, he comes out and he picks him up and the way he carries him back is that his chest is against his chest and he's carrying him as his feet are dragging. And he lays him at the tent. And again, you know, we talk about this, you know, like it's history. We need to understand the reality of it and look at it from the eyes of Rasulullah so from the eyes of Bibi Fatima alayhi, from the eyes of Imam Hussein al-Islam as it's happening. You know, this sacrifice wasn't given just, in, you know, haphazardly. Inshallah, we'll talk about this after Salat, Inshallah, if these time's up. But, uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand and see the reality of what happened then, which will also allow us to see the reality of what is going on now. Uh, and, you know, may He allow us, because the only way to see that reality is for us to have the love of Allah and His Messenger in our hearts. Sallallahu alayhi wa so may he give us that and give us the love of the family, the household of Rasulullah sallallahu as well as the companions and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah, inshallah.